So here we are in 2023 and uh, Red Bull are the, the team of the moment in Formula One yet again. Uh, for those people who follow Formula One, uh, it's no surprise because Red Bull have been a, a top team for many years. For people outside the, uh, the sport and who don't follow it, it's very often the question arises, well, so Red Bull, what do they do? They're not a car manufacturer. And the Red Bull story is such an interesting one because Red Bull came into Formula One by acquiring an uncompetitive team from uh, Ford Motor Company. They acquired the Jaguar Formula One team, a team which had never won a Formula One race in five years of trying. And the change which took place was so interesting because it was about leadership style, it was about culture. So Red Bull don't have more money than Ford, don't have a bigger factory. In fact, they inherited the factories that Ford had. So what was it that changed? Dietrich Mateschitz, the founder of Red Bull, came to the factory on the very first week that he had acquired uh, the company. And he talked to the former Jaguar Formula One team staff and he set out his vision. And his vision was very simple. We're gonna win the Formula One World Championship within five years. And he then talked about uh, the way in which that was going to happen. It was going to happen by each and every member of staff being empowered and enabled to become a ve the best version of themselves. His role as a leader was to create an environment within which people could thrive, to set the tone and the vision of the team and to support and coach and mentor and enable that team of people to excel. And what's extraordinary is that that's precisely what they went on to achieve, dominating Formula One between 2010, 2013, and now again in 2021, 22, and now 2023, Red Bull being top of the pile in Formula One. That's a story all about culture, all about leadership style, all about leaders influencing people in the, in the right way to work and giving them the opportunity to become the very best version of themselves and to enjoy the heyday of their career. What an incredible opportunity and a kind of infectious environment which is highly attractive to existing employees and of course your pipeline of talent that you wish to attract. Ford Motor Company was all about command and control back in those days. Ford itself has of course changed enormously. So Formula One has really seen the benefit of leadership styles changing from that command and control, telling people what to do, to a much more servant style of leadership where leadership teams create an, an environment within which a team can really excel at what they do. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. Um, and they talk about it blurring the boundaries between physical, digital and biological worlds. It, the fusion of advances in AI, robotics, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, genetic engineering, quantum com computing and technology. Uh, other than the genetic engineering, that's, pre that's pretty much the world of Formula One, isn't it? Um, but actually, it's the world of lots of organisations as well. And I think, you know, the inconvenient truth really is that despite those huge leaps uh, in industrial change and fundamental revolutions in how we work, some of those leadership principles and practices have barely evolved over the last 100 years. Um, while tech, whilst technology has innovated at speed, how we lead and manage hasn't. We've still got the power hierarchies, we've still got the functional separation, reductionism, uh, individual performance quotas, reward and punishment as motivators. And these are all, all kind of left over from the, from the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, and it really is extraordinary, isn't it, how many organisations get bound in, in structure and hierarchy and, uh, uh, and, and power play, quite frankly. And within Formula One, you know, we've, we have really seen, if you look at Mercedes-Benz and Red Bull, the top two teams of the last 15 years, both of them have very similar leadership uh, structures and indeed leadership styles within their business. It's one of genuine empowerment of the workforce, of creating an environment within which people can uh, excel by you know, playing to their strengths. So you're recruiting the smartest people you can, then let them get on with the job. And of course, in this complex world of fast changing technological environment, fast change regulatory environment, fast changing customer environment, you need to be able to get the best out of teams. And that's only going to become, that's only going to come by cascading the opportunity down for everybody to collaborate, to co-create, to work together, to create uh, great outcomes. So we've seen lots of examples over the years of, 
of, quite frankly, the good, the bad and the ugly in this way. And the, the striking thing is in Formula One, how often, you know, we see people come into the industry who haven't learned that this sort of agile, adaptive way of thinking is so essential in order to create winning outcomes. You've talked, about, you've talked about sort of Ford having a bit of command and control in the early days. You've talked about the sort of the leadership shift that came with Red Bull and Dietrich coming along. Um, I'm always sort of reminded of Toyota because Toyota had so much, didn't they? They had this, you know, they were the, they're just the quality experts. They had the Toyota production system, Kaizen approach to things, which, which proved so good in, in, in sort of stripping ahead of the US market with, with building cars and, and providing quality goods. Um, but they went eight years. And I don't think they ever had a win, did they? So what went wrong with Toyota? So this, is, this became one of the, the real case studies in, in how not to compete within our industry. Because for all of Toyota's successes, is the, their experience in Formula One really brought sharply into focus the fact that they're really bound up in, in hierarchy, in, in command and control style of management, in, in, on the one hand, employing very smart people, but on the other hand, not always giving them the opportunity to thrive within their environment. And within the book, I talk about um, uh, a lecture that I gave with Mike Gascoigne, who's the former chief technical officer at Toyota, in which he talked about failure and why they failed. And the fact that they, again, weren't benchmarking against the right things. They were benchmarking internally instead of externally against the competition. Decisions were not being made fast enough. Decisions were not being made on what the data was actually showing them. So ultimately, you know, Toyota's failure was an example of what happens when an organization, you know, despite having all the resource you could possibly wish, just wasn't able to deliver because they didn't have the ability to respond fast enough to the market in which they found themselves and to the, the fast changing technological and regulatory environment that was all around them. So, you know, improving one or two percent a year seemed very good. The problem is the competition were improving four or five percent every year. As a result, they never won anything. For more information, please visit sullivanstanley.com forward slash future business formula.